The Rams surprise in free agency by fortifying their offensive line. The Chargers, despite being tens of millions over the cap, spend anyway. And the Dodgers name their starters for the season opening series over in South Korea. Good morning. I'm James. This is your daily dose of sports and snark for the greatest sports city in the world, Los Angeles. This is the Faithful Angelino's Morning Report. So it is March 12, 2024, and it's a very exciting day for me. Not only am I back home with my extremely lovely wife, but I used the phrase no cap and I used it in its proper context. So congratulate your 56 year old white guy, still hip after all these years. And if you like being in the know about LA sports, click the clack the like button, click the clack the subscribe button. There's a notification bell, hit that. It'll let you know we drop new content. Sharing is caring, let people know we exist. And by all means, comment. Love, looking forward to hearing from you. Now, before we go through the news and notes, a look at the scoreboard. Yesterday, good day for the Kings. They shut out the Islanders, 3-0. Trevor Moore with a goal and an assist. Meanwhile, today, the Minnesota Timberwolves are going to be playing the Clippers at 7 o'clock. Glad to get through the scoreboard quick. We have a ton of news to get to, an absolute ton. So, prior to the start of the opening of NFL free agency, the chatter around the Rams. We gotta find another pass rusher. Maybe do a little something in the defensive backfield. That was the group thing that you were hearing in the press. So when the Rams decided to sign guard Jonah Jackson away from Detroit to a three-year $51 million deal, I scratched my head. And I don't like scratching my head. Because when I do, I start watching those precious few strands I have left on my scalp just flutter away in the distance. It's very touching. Must protect the precious strands. Do you see what I'm saying? But anyway, last week, as you might recall, the uh, Rams, they started their work by retaining uh, Kevin Dotson on the offensive line as a right guard. Dotson was rated the top interior offensive lineman in pro football, according to Pro Football Focus. Meanwhile, they bring in Jackson. Now, Jackson was part of a Lions offensive line that allowed the fourth fewest sacks in the NFL last year, which is neato. We know what the Rams looked like two years ago when Matthew Stafford had a bruised spine. But then you take a step back and you realize that the Rams spent $99 million on two guards. Not, not playmakers, not touchdown makers, but two guards. What? <laughs> and then especially, you consider that they loved a rookie guard that they drafted last year in Steve Avila. So you're sitting there going, what the hell gives? Then you have to think about it a second time and it doesn't sound so crazy. One of these dudes is going to have to play center. The Rams currently don't have one. So it's not going to be Dotson. Uh, his revival after he was booted out of Pittsburgh came because they specifically moved him to right guard. So he's not going anywhere. That leaves either Jackson or Avila. Sources told The Athletic that when Avila was drafted, there was discussion to play him at center because he had started at center for two years with TCU. Jackson, however, also has experience at center. He played one year there for Rutgers. All of that is going to have to be worked out. In the meantime, thanks for the memories. Coleman Shelton shouldn't have avoided that last year in your contract. Then the Rams added some insurance in case tight end Tyler Higby can't return from that nasty knee injury that he had in the playoffs. Colby Parkinson comes in from Seattle. Now, to be clear, he was only the third stringer for the Seahawks. So don't expect a game-changing addition here at tight end. Finally, when I uh, woke up this morning next to my wife that you don't get to meet, uh, I checked my phone and learned that the Rams had brought back cornerback Darius Williams from Jacksonville. He played three years with the Rams before signing a big money contract with the Jaguars two years ago. I don't know how much the contract is yet. It was literally only announced in the last 20, 30 minutes. And The Athletic are reporting that the Rams are expected to tender left tackle Alaric Jackson. So before we get to the Chargers, what are the big takeaways for the Rams? 
One, if the Rams do want to boost their pass rush, the primary way that they're going to look at it, in my opinion, has to be the draft, like they did last year, or possibly trade away draft picks to bring in a game-changing pass rusher. We do not know precisely how much money is committed already to next season. But from what I've been reading, the Rams have approximately six to $10 million left in salary cap space. Unless, of course, they restructure reserve offensive lineman Joe Noteboom's contract or cut him. They could get at least nine million, perhaps 15 million if they cut him later. But for now, all things being equal, the spending spree is over. The second thing to take away goes back to the offensive line. When Sean McVay first came to the Rams back in 2017, the offensive line was just massive and, and feisty and extremely effective. You know, you had your Andrew Whitworth, along with Ra uh, Roger Saffold, Austin Blythe, Rob Havenstein. And the middle three in that offensive line was key for Jared Goff's comfort as a first-year starter. You could not blitz him over the middle and therefore, he had time to make a decision. Goff is that guy. He can make great decisions as long as he's not jumpy in the pocket. But it wasn't just Jared Goff. It was helpful, obviously, for Todd Gurley, for the play action that they used to run a lot, for the RPO. And I think the Rams are trying to replicate that. The Chargers, after all this time, uh, finally told Austin Eckler to get out and don't let the door hit you where the good Lord split you. Despite being over the salary cap by $21 million going into free agency and with 48 hours to become cap compliant, the Bolts spent a lot of money anyway. Not as much as the Rams, but they spent money. The big thing that they did was they signed running back Gus Edwards away from Baltimore. And okay, I get it. When you hear of a guy with a name like Gus, you're thinking of a dude who's a longshoreman more than moving the chains on third down. But this move actually does make sense to the Chargers on a number of levels. Oh, uh, you recall general manager Joe Hortiz spent more than 25 years in the Baltimore Ravens personnel department. He knows this guy, Greg Roman, the former Ravens offensive coordinator. He too knows this guy. He's your classic tough guy running back, which we can assume that Jim Harbaugh would covet since he wants the Chargers to be more rugged. All three of them theoretically wanted this guy. Ravens uh, running backs, I should say Edwards led Ravens running backs. If you remember, Lamar Jackson accounted for about, oh, I don't know, 138% of the Ravens offense last year. But Edwards led the backs with 810 rushing yards, and he finished third in the league with 13 rushing touchdowns. So, flashy? Nah. What the Chargers are going to wind up looking like next year? Yeah. Now, this leaves Edwards as the primary back with Isaiah Spiller and Elijah Dotson because Eckler and jo uh, Joshua Kelly are free agents. That's still not going to keep the Chargers from drafting a back, but in the grand scheme of things, Edwards is the guy. Then they went out and extended uh, the contract for safety, Alohi Gilman. ESPN reported it was for two years at $11 million. And that makes sense, too because he works well with Derwin James. But then again, you go back and you ask yourself, what the hell does this mean for the cap? We have spoken the last couple of days about how the Bolts are trying to deal away wide receivers. You know, Keenan Allen or Mike Williams, how they would trade away edge rushers, Khalil Mack or Joey Bosa, hopefully to get assets back in cap relief. They went into free agency 21 million over, and now they're what? 26 mil? 30 mil? We don't know yet. But the pressure is on because if they can't restructure these contracts of a lot of players by Wednesday, or if they can't trade players or flat out cut them, the worst scenario is to cut because then you don't get anything in return. 
And by the way, if you are wondering about Austin Eckler, he is taking his minimal talents and his air guitar to the Washington Commanders. So there's that. The newbies will get the ball for the Dodgers for the so-called International Opening Day in South Korea next week. Tyler Glasnow and Yoshinobu Yamamoto will go for LA in a two-game series against Slum Diego. Hugh Darvish and Joe Musgrove, by the way, will be pitching for the Puds. The craziness of the Dodgers offseason is pretty much encapsulated by that decision because it's extremely easy to forget that the Dodgers acquired Glasnow from Tampa Bay. If he was the primary guy brought in in the offseason, all things being equal, you would say, that's not bad. If he was the crown jewel. But the Dodgers dropped more than a billion dollars in the offseason. Glasnow is an afterthought, which is kind of nutty. Gavin Lutz being shifted from shortstop to second base is, quote, not a big deal at all. Obviously, it's a little disappointing, but at the same time, we have three days before we go to Korea, so you just have to move on. As long as I'm in the lineup and I get to play, I don't really care where it is, unquote. Uh, just to recap, Lutz had been considered the shortstop of the future for years, but that kept getting delayed. The Dodgers would go out and they would have an elite shortstop, a Corey Seager or a Trey Turner. And then, of course, finally, when it was Lutz's time, his knee exploded. This year, though, Lutz is healthy. He just lost the gig because he can't master the throw from shortstop to first, which kind of sucks. Give me a little space on this next topic. I want to tell you how today's journalism relates to Kobe Bryant. In other words, I will get there. You will see where it relates to Kobe. But why do I always talk about the scribes and how the scribes are always letting us down? Okay, I want to link the two. The reason I'm so bitter about the state of American journalism is when newspapers and other media outlets, when they stopped making money in the Great Recession, they had to slash personnel. And that, by the way, is a bloodletting which continues to splatter along today. I might add, it's not the scribes that, that you should be shedding tears over. They always shed tears over the other scribes who lose their jobs. That, to me, is not the issue. The issue is the copy editors. When I was a reporter, I would turn in a story to an editor. The editor would read it, point out mistakes, and then I'd have to correct it. And then the article would go to another editor and another. Basically, what I'm getting to at is you would expect your story to be proofread four and possibly five times total. And these are people who are not just paid for spell checking. They read it for grammar. Does the headline match the story? If you use numbers, do the numbers add up? Do your sources back up the lead? Is this responsible and fair? Stuff like that, right? But the bean counters believe nobody would buy a newspaper for... They, they didn't think you would buy it for correct content. They just thought you would buy it for content. The content was the driver. So it became quantity journalism over quality journalism. Copy editors are always first on the chopping block because they don't produce content. They just simply make sure it's right. So what does all this mean? It was discovered that there are four misspellings in the Kobe Bryant statue outside Crypto.com Arena. Proof readers count, guys. Proof readers count. Two names on the statue are misspelled. Two other words are misspelled. But at least they got Kobe figured out. That part was spelled correctly. So slow clap. For all of those who forget the importance of those who proofread your work. Well done, guys. Uh, the Orange County Register reports that Lakers forward Cam Reddish is still dealing with significant soreness in his right ankle. In other news, in wee hours prior to kickoff on Sunday, LA Galaxy assistant coach Nick Thesloff allegedly enjoyed Broadway in Nashville a little bit too much and got arrested for public drunkenness. Alleged public drunkenness, I should say. He was released on $100 bail and did coach the match 
And I gotta tell you something, this story bothers me a lot because it's yet another example of how much cheaper it is to live in Tennessee. Really? Wouldn't you like to wake up and have to pay only a hundred bucks to get out of the drunk tank? Anyone? Thanks for nothing, Governor Newsom. You could ravage a target and steal everything, including the court ha uh, coat hangers and the racks. Nobody has a problem with that. But if you have just one little drippy drop, too many in the alcohol department, here's the squad, here's the handcuffs, good night now, you're gone for about a week. 100 bucks out in Nashville. Meanwhile in Nashville, they're like, hey, turn the music up, Clem. The Ontario Clippers, the G League affiliate of uh, the LA Clippers are no more. The G League team is gonna be leaving the Inland Empire for Oceanside and will be rebranded as the San Diego Clippers. Just a humble little twist of the knife to remind Slum Diego that we keep stealing, or actually I should say adopting the teams that they no longer support or never did. There's a new arena out in Oceanside that will have luxury suites, lounges, an open air patio. I totally don't care. I don't watch G League basketball, but whatever. You let me know what you think in the comments thread. What do you think about what the Rams and Chargers did on the opening day of free agency? And what do you think about the choice of starters for the Dodgers out in South Korea? If you enjoyed the content, don't forget to subscribe to Faithful Angelinos. We are talking LA sports every single day here. Thank you for watching. I'm James. We'll be back tomorrow. Faithful Angelinos is a Kian Corte El Queso production. Take care.